Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Can you believe it? Tonight we end the book of Revelation. And it's been such an amazing time going through this book. But as we heard right now, Maranatha, right? Lord, come. This is exactly the message that we receive as we close this book. And not only are we coming to the close of this book, but we're coming to the close of the book. We're coming to the close of the Bible. This is the last chapter of Scripture. And we've titled tonight's message, Behold, I'm Coming Quickly. If you like taking notes, write that down. Behold, I'm coming quickly. You know what happens when the Lord says, Behold, I'm coming quickly? We say, Come, Lord Jesus. Can we say that out loud? Come, Lord Jesus. Really believing that He's coming again. Really believing that we desire for Him to return. Now, we started this book really underlining, really defining that the book of Revelation truly is the revelation of Jesus Christ from chapter 1. We see that John, now in the island of Patmos, receives a vision of Jesus. And there he writes this book for the church and for us. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now the clearer Jesus becomes to us, specifically through prophecy, the clearer the calling that He has on our lives personally should be. The clearer you see Jesus today, the more clearer you will see God's calling for your life right now. Our attitude should be that we want to see Jesus. Why? Because all Bible prophecy centers around Jesus. And if you're not coming, if you're hearing a study, and if it doesn't come, prophecy to the core of Jesus Christ, then we have the wrong interpretation of prophecy. Prophecy is not simply to give you an illustration of current events. Prophecy is so that we would see Jesus more. That's why this book is called the Revelation, the unveiling of the future events, but more so the unveiling of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know this, and many of you don't, but there in uh, the Gospels, in the Gospel of John, we've read it before where it says that the Greeks came, they wanted to meet uh, Jesus, and they came and told Andrew, uh, sir, that we would see Jesus. That is the goal, that we would see Jesus. Now, for many years, and even right now in this pulpit, there's a plaque. Every time I walk up to this pulpit, even Pastor Jeff had it in the, the pulpit prior to this one, and it says those very words. Every time we walk up here, it says, Sir, right there, that we would see Jesus. As a reminder that the reason why we're here is because we today want to see Jesus. How many of us want to see Jesus tonight in His Word? Amen. And as we read chapter 21, we're learning about being satisfied by Him in the New Jerusalem. But now how do you respond to the Lord's return? How should we respond today? The last chapter of the book of Revelation should bring to us an inventory that Jesus is coming again. He is coming soon. And if He is coming soon, then we cannot just keep living the same way that we have always have. We need to live as if He is coming soon. Do you remember in chapter 1 of Revelation that John received a revelation of Jesus and it caused him to prostrate himself and fall face down and worship the Lord? That the 24 elders of the four living creatures fell down face down and worshiped the Lord as they saw a revelation of the throne of God. And today that's the posture that we want to have as we conclude this chapter, that we would say, Lord, come, Jesus. Here we are, we're waiting for You. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So we see here in chapter 22 a few things that we're going to look at as we go through this chapter. Number one is the refreshment in the New Jerusalem. Then the reaction of John as he is once again introduced to the fact that Jesus is coming again. And then also the reward for the church that 
Christ will judge our works at the Bema Seat. And then the receivers of this blessing, who is it that will enjoy of these special blessings? Let's go there to Revelation 22, verse 1. It says, And He showed me a pure river of water of life. This is the river in the New Jerusalem. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its tree, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Underline that in your Bibles. There will be no more curse in eternity, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They shall need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before You right now, Lord. And we want to say thank You because You've given us, Lord, a revelation of who You are in this book. A revelation as to what to expect, Lord, as we are living in the last days. But we ask, Lord, that You would not only teach us this as information, but that we would receive it for transformation. So change our lives today, Lord, so that we live as if You're coming today. In Jesus' name. And together we said, Amen. Now notice here as we see the river of life, it's a pure river there of water of life. And you see that John is saying, He showed me, He revealed to me there in verse 1. What was it? A pure river a of water of life. And this river really, what it gives us, it, it teaches us the richness the water of life, the provision, the peace there in the New Jerusalem, that this river was the source of all life. We know that there was no sea in heaven in the New Jerusalem, now in the new heaven, in the new earth. But we have a river, this, the river of the water of life in where we find the source of life there. And it was clear as crystal. Notice that it describes it thou proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. What is it? A symbol of eternal life. A symbol of continual blessing. This river of water of life. But it's flowing from the throne. It comes from the throne of God. It comes from the throne of the Lamb of God. That's where the water is coming from. In fact, it reminds us of Ezekiel chapter 47, where there also is a river coming from the temple. But this is also an expression here, this river or the water of life, of what Jesus said when He referenced the Holy Spirit as rivers of living waters. In John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus said, on the final day of the feast, He who believes in Me, as the Scripture has said, out of His heart will flow rivers of living waters. What did he mean by that then in the Gospel of John? That he was symbolizing the new covenant of the Holy Spirit. He who believes in me will be filled with torrents, with rivers of living water. Here in the new Jerusalem, we see the Spirit, the water of life, Christ Himself supplying a never-ending supply of divine life. He is the source of life. That we are living off the water of life. But not only is there a river there, notice verse 2 also, and in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was a tree of life. Now we see the river as our source of life, but notice the tree speaks of abundant life. Notice how it describes the tree because it was there flowing down. The river is flowing down the, the center of the main street, but on the each side of it, you notice verse 2 as it continues here, each side of the river was the tree of life. In the beginning of the Bible, we're introduced to a tree, and at the end of the Bible, we're introduced to a tree as well. It's the tree of life. It's the tree that gives life. And notice this tree, it says, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. Every month, it yields fruit. But not only does it yield fruit, it's different types of fruits. 
the leaves of a tree were for the healing of the nations. So here it speaks of the variety, the blessing, the fruit, that it's fresh for 12 months. Now speaking of the abundance that we receive in heaven. Now what does it speak of here when it says the the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations? The healing here speaks of it was medicinal. Or it was health giving. It was therapeutic. That's what he's referring to or he's describing. He's describing now something that is truly satisfying. So this life in the river of life and this fruit in the tree of life speak of an abundant life that is truly satisfying, that is ministering to us. You see that word healing comes from the same word that we receive ministering to. Christ ministers to us through the river of life and through the tree of life giving us life in abundance. What does this symbolize here? Abundant life of the glorious city. But these two here illustrations only point to the resurrection of all things. As we mentioned before now, at this point, Satan and his demons are cast to the lake of fire already. And you see that also displayed in the fact that the curse of sin has been reversed. There's no longer going to be a curse for our sin in this fallen nature that we experience right now. Notice the authority of Christ as He reverses this curse. It would say this, and there shall be no more curse, no more sin. Why? Because God is ruling and reigning for eternity here and no longer do we live under the power or the dominion or the nature of sin. He will reverse the curse of sin on creation and also at all types of creature or the human race. It speaks of a full restoration there in verse 3. But the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. What's going to happen in heaven is that we will be in a perfect fellowship with God as Adam and Eve were before the fall. It's going to be an intimate fellowship. And the throne is going to be there, and the Lamb of God is going to be there, and His servants, notice there in verse 3, will serve Him. It's going to be perfect service. What are we going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be worshiping the Lord, but we also are going to be serving the Lord. You see here, it describes our occupation there. His servants will serve Him in perfect ministry in the absence of sin now. And in verse 4 and 5, it continues, it says, and they shall see His face. We shall see His face. We see His authority in that He reverses the curse of sin. He brings us into a state of eternal perfection and fellowship and intimacy. But then in verse 4 and 5, we see His ownership over now His servants. Because it begins and it says they will see His face. This is the believer's hope. Today, maybe if we're going through discouragement or through trials, it's the Christians and the churches that receive this letter. Notice what happens. They received hope that one day they would see the face of Jesus. Today, maybe you find yourself discouraged. You find yourself maybe now burdened with the trials of this life. Now you can look at this verse. and says, and they shall see His face. One day, we will see Him face to face. John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, for we shall be like Him in our glorified bodies. We're going to be like Him now. And we shall see Him as He is. Isn't that amazing to think that one day we will see Him face to face? And we're going to see Him just as He is? In fact, He wrote that when He was writing His epistle to the churches. But not only are we going to see Him just as now He is, it also says there in verse 4 now, and His name shall be on their foreheads. What does this mean? That He will now stamp His name on our foreheads that we will now have an identification of His possession. We will be identified as His possession that there will be no doubt that we belong to the Lord forever. He's going to write His name on our foreheads. You think about that. The Antichrist, what does he do? He tries to counterfeit everything that the Lord does. 
And he says, receive the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your hands. Why? Because he understands and he knows that the plan of God is that he would identify his own for eternity as he writes in his own name now on our foreheads. This is the fulfillment of the promise to the faithful believers of the church of Philadelphia. Back when we studied the seven churches of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus tells them to the church of Philadelphia, he says, he who overcomes, he who lives a life that's victorious or obedient, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out from heaven, my God, and I will write on him my new name. This is the fulfillment to the faithful believers, to those that remain loyal, to those that remain faithful, to those that are waiting for the Lord, that we will receive his name on our foreheads. They would say in verse 5, as it continues, there shall be no night there, no darkness, no need for rest. There will no need for a lamp or light or sun, for the Lord God gives them light. They shall reign forever and ever. There will be an end to darkness. And God is going to give us light. His light is going to shine on us, and it's going to be the majesty of God, the glory of God, the kind of glory of the light and the glory and splendor of God that gives us light, that there would be no need for any other light, but the glory of God will give us light there. And what does it say? And they shall reign with Him forever and ever. That's exactly what we will do as we worship the Lord, as we serve Him, as we live a life victorious for eternity. Now notice, as John receives this final message in regards to heaven, And what we do in heaven, notice his reaction in verse 6. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Everything you've heard and everything you've seen since chapter 1 is trustworthy. It is true. In fact, it comes from the Lord God of the holy prophets. It comes from God who inspired the prophets to write the word of God. And he has sent his angel to show his servants, to show us, to show the church the things that must shortly take place. Why was he writing this for us? Why is it that we receive this book so that we know him and that we know the things that must shortly take place, the things that will happen soon to inform us so that we would not be ignorant, that we would be not naive, that we would be understanding of the times. But now that he has identified us to the objective as to why we need the revelation of Jesus Christ. He provides five reasons here that we want to really focus on, five primary responses or responsibilities in light of the great return of the Lord. Just just imagine this. If you knew right now the Lord told you, listen, tomorrow at 10 a.m., I'm going to come for my church. I'm going to rapture the church. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., I want you to know that. I'm giving you a day and a time. I guarantee that tonight we go home and we start making a lot of changes. We start making phone calls. We start now asking for forgiveness. We go now tomorrow to work and we start talking to our boss different because there's a response that we know that by 10, everything must be settled, that we would have short accounts with God. I want to invite you right now that you would have short accounts with God. That you would live a life as if he's coming tonight. And that you want to make things right before he comes. So what is our responsibility? Notice verse 7. He speaks of the first one, which is our walk. Write that word down, our walk. And he says this, behold, look. I want you to see. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming shortly. And here he speaks of the walk. Now, verse 7. Blessed is he, or oh, how happy is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Why does this have to do with our walk? Because he's saying, oh, how happy. Oh, what a blessed life for those who keep or those who obey the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, the word keep in this original Greek language means to guard. Oh, how happy those who guard the words of this book. Oh, how happy those who obey the words of this prophecy, those who hold 
fast in their own lives as to what has been said. You know, when it comes to our walk, when it comes to prophecy, in relation one to the other, we have to be treasuring His Word, guarding His Word, obeying His Word, trusting His Word, and everything that we say, but also in the way that we live our lives. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he says this, hold fast. Would you hold fast right now? Would you guard those things that we have received in the Word of God? That you would guard the Word of truth with your life? That you would live it out? The pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus? He tells Timothy, Timothy, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Keep this, guard this, that you would walk this. Now, blessed are those who keep this. Do you see that the revelation of Jesus Christ, that this book was not given to us to entertain us? So many people look at Revelation and they want to instantly be sensationalized. Well, let's, let's try to find out what this supposedly could mean. We don't study God's Word to know what it could mean. We study God's Word for what it does say. It's not to entertain us. It's not so simply we can always look forward to a, a prophecy update or to provide information for endless charts and tours and updates and wrong dates. You know what it was given for us to do? Right there, number one, it tells us it's to provide an extremely powerful motivation to live a godly life. To live a godly life. Our perspective after reading this book should be less temporal and more eternal. A Christian who understands, a man and God, a woman of the Lord who understands the message of Revelation has no reason, after reading this book, has no reason to live a double life or to have a double standard. Because he understands, because you understand the truth of the Word of God. Number one, your walk. That should be your response. But then also, number two, in verse 8 through 11, we see our worship. This should cause you to worship more. You find out how many times there's worship involved in heaven. That is primarily one of the things that we're going to be doing in heaven. So if you can't worship for 30 minutes at church, how will you do it for eternity? <laughs> We need more worship as we congregate together, not less. Worship now is the entire reason as to why we come together. It's a worship service. And we read God's Word so that we know Him better so that we can worship Him more. <laughs> that is it. Everything in your life flows from worship, from us worshiping the Lord. Now notice His response. Verse 8, Now I, John, saw and heard these things when I heard I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now notice how he is now led astray there. He's gone astray after hearing all these things. He heard, he saw, he fell at the feet of the angel for the second time now. And look what the angel does. We oftentimes, when we see the Lord do a powerful work, what does it do? Our attention instantly oftentimes shifts to that messenger. <laughs> And that's what John did. He starts to worship, then he falls down before the angel. But the angel tells him here, he said to me, see that you do not do that. See that you do not worship the messenger. Do not worship man. Do not worship the servant. Notice how he says it. For I'm your fellow servant of your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. I am a fellow servant. I'm a servant just like you, just like the prophets. Of those who keep, of those who have obeyed the words of this book. In fact, notice what he says. Worship God. Circle that in your Bible. Worship God. Do not put ever a man on a pedestal in your heart or in your mind. Why? Because God is the one that is on the throne. Who do we worship? We worship God. How can you read this book and not respond in worship? How can we possibly understand these revelations and then not worship the Lord? We come, we say, Lord, we want you to return. We know how the story ends. So we are called to worship God. In fact, God is seeking worshipers that will worship Him in spirit and in what? In truth. John 4, 23, what did Jesus tell the Samaritan woman? That God is seeking out worshipers. When we come to church and when you 
or out having your devotional time, your private time with the Lord, I pray and I want to encourage you that your devotional time would be enriched even more so. Not simply because you pray, not simply when you read, but also because you involve worship. You want to really be ministered by the Lord, then spend time in your devotional time with the Lord worshiping. Slow down. Take time to worship the Lord, not because of what He has done, but because of who He is. Because of who He is. That we would worship Him in spirit and in truth, in reality. For He is seeking such to worship Him that way. So we have our walk, we have our worship, but we also have, verse 10 and 11, our witness. Our witness. Notice here, and He said to me, do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Don't seal this up. To Daniel, the prophecy was given to him, and, he, and the Lord told him, seal it up. Seal the words of this prophecy. But here at the end of Revelation, what does now this angel tell the apostle John here? Don't seal the words. Let these words be open. Let them be available. Let them be revealed. Don't keep it to yourself. I want you to know that today. When it comes to your witness, do not keep it to yourself. You know how this story ends today. The time is near. In fact, this is the reason as to why we need a witness. It says, for the time is at hand. The time of these events, of the return of Christ, of the judgment that is to come upon the sin of this world, its fulfillment is potentially near, so people need to know so that they have an understanding of the times. Let them know. Give them the words. Give them the words. Know the word and give them the words. Don't seal this prophecy so that you can be a witness. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul's encouragement to young Timothy, he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker. Today, you know what we are? We're workers. Who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to know the Word of God and not seal it, not keep it to ourselves. Let others know about the Word of God. So it comes to our walk. It affects our worship, but it also now has an impact on our witness. And then verse 11, our willingness. Number four, our willingness. Notice, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be Holy still. There are going to be people that are unwilling to receive the truth. Those whose hearts are hardened, it says, they will live out their lives true to their nature until the final judgment. What does Christ require? What does he want from us? What does the Lord want? Jesus wants willing hearts, not reluctant ones. Today, are you willing today? Or are you hesitating when it comes to your walk with the Lord? Are you reluctant? Are you saying, you know what, well, I, I want to follow Christ, but I also want to follow the appetites of my flesh. No, are you willing to follow Christ wholeheartedly? Your willingness. So when it comes to your walk, when it comes to your worship, when it comes to your witness, when it comes to your willingness, but also from verse 12 to, and on, when it comes also to your work, what are we to do as Christ comes? Occupy. <laughs> Occupy until he comes. In verse 12 it says, And behold, I am coming quickly. This is the second time he says it in this chapter. He's going to repeat this three times in one chapter. And behold, look, I am coming quickly. I'm returning soon. And he wants you to know how he's returning soon. My reward is with me. My reward, he's coming now. And when he comes... Notice what there will be in heaven as he raptures his church and as we are there in heaven, he is going to reward us according to our works. There's going to be a rewards ceremony and service up in heaven where all our works will be now tested. We're going to be held accountable for our works. Why? Because it's not going to be only about if you serve them here on earth. It's about how you serve them. So when it comes to your work, that it would not be careless service. They would truly be from the heart. It's not only about if you're doing ministry. 
It's about how you're doing ministry. Today, maybe you think, well, you know what? I am doing ministry, and I do ministry a lot, or I'm involved, or my hands are always now in the plow of serving the Lord. Yes, that is great, but how are you doing it with your heart, from your heart? The value of your work is always dependent upon the attitude of your heart. I want to say that again so that you would really remember that. The value of your work is always dependent upon the attitude of your heart. And here when he speaks of this in verse 12, he says, my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. To give to everyone according to his work. To repay. Right there where it says to give everyone, it means to repay to their works. It speaks of the Bema seat. So the unbeliever will face the Lord at the white throne judgment. Yes. And now the books will be opened to see whether your name is written in the book of life for the unbeliever. But for the believer, they will stand before the Bema seat of Christ, which for us is a very powerful incentive to live a life of godliness and of obedience, knowing we're going to stand before the Bema seat of Christ. And as we stand before the Bema seat of Christ, our names written in the book of life already, we have been saved. He's there going to judge now us for our motivations for our intentions, for the purity of our work to see if our work truly was done for the Lord. In fact, notice how it says it there in verse 12, to give now everyone according to his work. I'm the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He uses the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. This expresses God's fullness. This expresses God's comprehensiveness, that he knows everything, that he is never out of anything. His all-inclusiveness here. I am the beginning and I am the end. He is the source of all things and will bring all things to an appointed end. Notice what it speaks of here for us. Number one, in verse 12, behold, again, I am coming quickly. Behold, I'm coming quickly. You see, this is important for us because it gives us here, number one, a a sense of readiness. I want to share with you three things as we end tonight. A sense of readiness. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Readiness. Jesus himself says, therefore you also be what? Ready. (laughs) That you would be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. The Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect. When you least expect it, he's going to (laughs) come. So always be ready, expecting the Lord's return, that we would have a sense of readiness, that we would not only say Maranatha, but that we would live Maranatha. (laughs) Number two, when we speak and we think about the Bema Seat of Christ, it speaks of accountability. Do you know that's one of the least things that people like, especially in their lives, accountability, commitment? We don't like to be held accountable. But when you get to heaven, your work's will be tested. And you're going to be surprised how much of your works, as they're tested in the fire, how much actually will survive. Were they done in the pure motive intentions or were they done in selfishness with an agenda, a self-serving motivation? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul speaks of this accountability. He says this, on each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. When we get to heaven, notice, as he comes and his reward is with him, with him we're going to stand before Christ. And it says, your work will become clear on that day. It is because it will be revealed by fire. The Lord will now gather all your works, all your service. And he's going to put it in the fire. And he's going to test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it and endures, he will receive a reward. Notice, you're going to only receive a reward for the works that have been now tested through fire and have endured. Everything else that was done for people, for man, for show, for yourself, you will not receive rewards for those things. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as though the fire. So what is it that we are to do when we think about the beam of seed of Christ and the return 
of Christ, that we would be doing the will of God. Do the will of God by the power of God, and then finally, for the glory of God. That everything that we're doing, we're doing it for the glory of God. That there's no hidden agendas. When you do something for Christ, make sure that there's no hidden agendas. That the motivation as to why you say you're going to do it for the Lord, it's not because you're going to receive something out of it. Because God does not receive those works or services that are motivated by selfishness. Notice, we will stand before the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul tells the church of Corinth the same thing. They were serving him in carnality, in the flesh. And he says this, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether we're present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each must receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We're all going to stand before Christ. And we're going to receive those things that were done, whether good or whether they were bad. So how are we to live? We are to live a life of holiness, of integrity, of heart. That the things that we do, notice that the things that we do, we do them for the glory of God. What is it? Notice, so many people, when they get to heaven, they're going to realize that the works that they did, they will not receive rewards for. Because they weren't done with the right hearts. In fact, notice, it is possible to have a saved soul, but then a wasted life. Don't have a wasted life. That your life would be fully being lived out. That everything you do, you did it for the Lord. It wasn't for yourself. That judgment seat of Christ, I want you to look at this first and understand something very clearly. It's going to be either a time of great regret for many, or if you, it's going to be a time of and an occasion of supreme joy where you are just filled with joy because you know that everything you did, you did it for the Lord. Not because of what you can get rewarded here on earth, but because you want to be rewarded in heaven. Would you rather be compensated here on earth or in heaven? Would you rather say, you know what, well, I've served the Lord many years. I want to receive my compensation that is due to me right now. Sure, if you receive your compensation here, guess what? Everything that you did when you get to heaven, no, you receive your compensation already there on earth. That's why we don't live for the rewards here on earth. We don't live for the accolades of this world. What do we live for? For the rewards that come from heaven. Finally, Romans 14, verse 12, it would say this, Romans 14, 12, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Who's going to give an account of himself to God? Each of us. There's not going to be one that says, you know what, well, you know what, you can just go. You don't have to give an account of yourself. As we're standing in line, notice we're going to stand alone. When we stand before that now beam of seat of Christ, we're going to stand alone. And each one will give an account of who? Of himself. You're not going to be able to call someone to stand with you before you stand before the beam of seat of Christ being judged of your works. You can't say, you know what, uh, just you know, give me a second, I'm going to call my overseer. He's going to stand with me, he'll explain to you how good I serve the Lord over at Calvary Chapel. Well, let me just call my pastor or my parent. No one will stand with you. No one will stand for you. No one can give an account for your own life, and you cannot give an account for someone else. You will give an account of yourself before God in the fear that you are standing in his presence. You see why it's so important that we live a life that is not only ready, but also is accountable, because you're going to give an account. Readiness, accountability, but also here, notice, discipline. Discipline. In fact, Paul said this, at the end of his life, he speaks of a life of discipline. And he says this to that church that was struggling with fighting with one another, was struggling to, uh, of doing things to, to receive attention. You always know someone that really wants attention or, or is doing it uh, to really create noise or a following for themselves. It doesn't matter how many people follow you. Is, are they following Jesus? Don't do it for the attention. Don't do it for the platform, for the promotion. Do it for the Lord. You're going to find out how much works that were done truly with pure motives. What are your motives? You may try to hide your motives right now, before man, 
but you will not hide your motives before God. All of your motivations in the fire, they're going to surface. They're going to be exposed. So may we not be those that are filled with shame on that day. A readiness, accountability, and finally, discipline. 1 Corinthians, write this down. 1 Corinthians 9.24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So today, live in a life that you're going to obtain the prize. Don't just run this race of the Christian life to receive a reward for participation. Well, look at me. I'm running. I'm in the race. Do you see me? I have a number. <laughs> no, run in the race because you want to win. What does it mean? Purposefully. Be very intentional about you, how you live your life for the kingdom of God. That you would train yourself as one that runs. You'd be constantly in training for the Christian race, the Christian life. It says, and everyone who competes for a prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do not all obtain the perishable crown. When someone runs in a race, not everyone receives a reward. But we, yes, all of us, for an unperishable crown. Just think about us. We know that if we run this race well, we will receive a crown that doesn't get old. That no one can take away. So he says, therefore I run, thus, not with uncertainty. I don't, I don't run like someone that doesn't know where he's going. I run because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm headed. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. I don't just try to impress someone with how I can shadow box. I'm not a shadow boxer, he says. I'm running the race to win. I'm boxing in this truly spiritual war and fight, but I discipline my body and bring it under subjection. Readiness, accountability, and discipline. I discipline my body. He's coming again. And bring it under obedience, under submission. Do you discipline your body to the point where your body serves you and you don't serve your body? I bring it under submission. Notice, that's when I have preached to others so that when I, don't, when I preach to others, I myself should not be disqualified. When you stand at the beam of seat of Christ, understand everything in your mind and your heart, your motivations are going to be exposed on that day. So we as believers, what should we do? We should say, Lord, Purify our hearts so that truly everything that we do glorifies you, that we don't masquerade Christian works and service in the name of Jesus when we have an agenda because God will hold us accountable. I want you to know this. God will hold you accountable for every single thing you did here on earth. Let's pray.